Lord for that old rugged cross. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible open to Revelation chapter number three, we've come to the seventh and the final letter to the seven churches here in the book of Revelation. And this is the letter to the church of the Laodiceans. Now remember these letters are letters that John has recorded and had the responsibility to see that uh, these churches and the pastors of these churches referred to as the angel of the church uh, here in, uh, in the Bible. Uh, it was John's responsibility to see that these churches received these letters. These were real churches in real places, uh, in, in real cities and communities. And the last one here is in the, in the city of uh, Laodicea. And uh, it's a letter that is from the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not John's letter, it's the Lord's letter. John is simply doing the work as a secretary to, uh, to write the letter down and to see that it gets to uh, its recipients. And so in Revelation chapter 3, we pick up with verse number 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked? I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you for the reading of the Word of God this evening. We thank you once again for this wonderful book of the Revelation. And Lord, we just ask now that you would speak to our hearts and, and Lord, help us to understand the things of God, that we could be equipped, that we could be able to serve you. And Lord, help us to realize the lateness of the hour that we're living in in these last days. And Lord, this final letter to the seven churches, this letter to the church of Laodiceans, Lord, we know that, that there is much here that is very applicable to the time that we're living in right now. And so Lord, help us to learn, uh, help us to understand, help us to see, and Lord, we'll thank you for all you do. And as always, we would pray once again that there could be souls saved and lives would be changed and, and that revival will come. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You can be seated. Uh, the church, uh, this letter to the church of Laodiceans, uh, of the seven letters uh, to the churches, I would suspect that this one may very likely be the most familiar one uh, to each of us today because you've probably heard more preaching uh, in your lifetime uh, on this particular letter than, than you did perhaps the others. This is the church, the church of Laodicea that is known as the lukewarm church. It's the lukewarm church. And it really is a picture of the modern day church today. What Jesus says to this church is especially applicable to us. And, it's, and it, it can be applied both to repentance and revival for a backslidden believer and also to evangelism and salvation uh, for the lost person, for sinners. It is indeed a needful message and a timely message, a timely letter uh, for us today. You can actually divide this section in two ways. 
First of all, from verse 14 down through verse number 16, you have an identification uh, that is given to us. And, and then in verse 17 down through verse number 22, there is an invitation. The Lord really uh, gives an invitation to the church. And I think even to us and even to people today. And so you can divide the letter up in those two ways. We're going to concentrate on just the one verse in the beginning of the letter in verse number 14 this evening. And think, some little bit, uh, think a little bit here about, about the, the church and the community itself. And think a little bit also about the Lord Jesus Christ who sent this letter. And as you recall, in each one of the letters, Jesus would present himself or identify himself or define himself you know, to the churches in a particular way for the particular church. And he does that uh, here for the Laodiceans in, in, in chapter 3 also. And so notice with me, first of all, a little bit about the community of the church, the place there of Laodicea. How it said in verse number 14, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. So this is the church of the Laodiceans. Notice with me the introduction of the church here. It's all we have is just the name there, the church of the Laodiceans. We really do not have a record of the founding of the church uh, at all here in, a, in the Bible. And, 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 and nor are we told that the Apostle Paul in his missionary uh, journeys uh, had ever visited there. Uh, we think that it may be uh, one of Paul's disciples and, and helpers uh, in his journeys, uh, man, the man by the name of Epaphras, uh, that was instrumental perhaps in starting the church uh, in Laodicea. We do know that Paul communicated with the church, with the people of the church, and he had a great concern for this particular church of the Laodiceans. Notice with me in Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians chapter number 2. And reading verse 1 and verse number 2, the Apostle Paul writes and says, for I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea. And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the, of the Father and of Christ. And so he's concerned about the, the Laodiceans, about the church in Laodicea, and he mentions them in his letter to the church in Colossae. Notice also, if you would, in Colossians chapter number 4, Colossians chapter 4 and verse 12 and verse 16, here we have the mention of the one uh, Paul's helper by the name of Epaphras. And it, and it says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in uh, Hierapolis. And so Paul uh, recognizes this one, uh, Epaphras, it's interesting that he makes note here that, that Epaphras has a, a great zeal, a great concern, uh, a great love, I suppose we could say, for uh, those that are in Laodicea and this other place of Herapolis. And then he, said, he mentions Luke, verse 14. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Salute the brethren. Now watch this in verse 15. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea. And so there's evidence there of the church being there in Laodicea, even though Paul, we have no record of Paul actually being there or Paul actually being the one who started the church. And, and so, but he says, salute the brethren in Laodicea. He knew of them, communicated with them, Laodicea and Nymphus and the church which is in his house. And so uh, Nymphus ev ev evidently was uh, a, a man in Laodicea. The church there was meeting in this man's house. 
And so Paul knew all about them, and he was concerned about them. It says in verse number 16, And when this epistle, so the epistle to the Colossians, and when this epistle is read among you, cause it to be read also in the church of the Laodiceans. Isn't that interesting? The church of the Laodiceans. And that ye likewise read the epistle from the Laod from Laodicea. And, uh, and so here is Paul recognizing the church there of the Laodiceans. And so there is the church. There's no doubt about that. The church was established there. But then think about the city itself with me. There is a lot of information that can be found in other writings uh, for uh, this city of Laodicea back in the first century, back in the time that the letter to the Revelation was written, uh, recorded by John and sent to the churches. And so think about the importance of the city because it was an important city. And there is uh, quite a deal of information concerning uh, Laodicea. For one thing, we know that it was important because of its money. Because of its money, it was a wealthy place. Laodicea was located near Colossae. That may be, give evidence as to why the Apostle Paul, in writing his letter to Colossians, would include you know, a recognition of the Laodiceans. It was close by. Laodicea was located near Colossae, about 45 miles southeast of Philadelphia, uh, with the church that we just studied about in the previous letter, and almost 100 miles east of Ephesus. It was known as a very wealthy city. And it was one of the most prosperous cities in all of that area of the world in that day in Asia Minor because it was also a banking center uh, for the whole region uh, there. Had many industries. The chief industry there was the manufacturing of a somewhat of a soft, glossy type of wool uh, material of which expensive, very expensive clothing in their day was made from. There were factories that would produce four kinds of outer garments that would be exported all throughout the world from this city of Laodicea. It was also important for its medicine. It was known for medicine. There was a famous medical school there that was known for two kinds of medicine. One was an, an ointment that was used to cure sore eyes, and another was a, a, an eye powder. Uh, it was called Phrygian powder, and it was world famous in that day as a remedy for weak and sore eyes. Isn't that interesting? Because in the letter itself, if you'll notice with me once again, verse 17 and verse 18, when Jesus speaking to the church here, he says, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Notice in verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that, that thou may seest. Isn't that an interesting thing? He uses that and, get, and Jesus is of course speaking on a spiritual level, a spiritual need here, but he uses that to uh, this undoubtedly understanding what this city was known for. One of the things it was known for was this eye salve for this eye uh, medicine. And so the point that is being made here, I think in verse 17, verse 18 is they were rich and well physically, but Jesus said they were poor and blind spiritually. And isn't that uh, a really a vivid description of much of the world today, especially in, in, in cities and places today. And I think it's a description of much of, of modern day churches today. And so we're introduced to the church there and we know, we understand a little bit that we can find out about the place or the city of Laodicea. But tonight I just want us to especially take note of the Lord Jesus Christ once again and how he 
presents himself to this particular church, how he describes himself in the beginning of the letter in verse number 14. And, and so as we, as we see the community of the church, we take note also of the character of the communicator, the character of the one who is sending the letter, who is sending the message, who is communicating to them. And so verse 14, once again, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. That is how Jesus describes himself to this church. A church that undoubtedly was wealthy because it was in a wealthy community. It, it, its membership uh, very likely would have been made up of some wealthy people. Uh, people who were involved in that industry, that, that wool industry that, was, that made those outer garments that exported all around the world. People who were in the medical field and, and perhaps people who worked in the laboratories that developed the eye salve and the medicine that, that, the, that the hospital there in the city uh, became so well known for. And so it was a wealthy city, wealthy people. Undoubtedly, it was indeed a, a wealthy congregation, a wealthy church. And so Jesus says to them that he is the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And so before we get into his actual message and the things that as we see in the reading of this letter, there were things about the church here that Jesus was very concerned about that he was bothered about, that he was troubled with. Uh, so troubled that he would say that they were just, uh, uh, they were neither cold nor hot, they were lukewarm. So much so that he said that they actually uh, would make him, if I could just say it, uh, and, uh, and you understand kind of a rough way to say it, but he would say that they would make him sick to his stomach. He said, because thou art lukewarm in verse 16, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. He has some very strong, some very harsh words really to say about this church. He says, you, you say that you're rich, you're increased with goods in verse number 17. You say that you have need of nothing, but you don't even know the real state uh, the situation that you're in. You don't even recognize or know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And may I submit to us uh, uh, this evening, church, that that is indeed a very vivid description, I believe, of, of modern day churches today that have everything, have the money, and have all these things, but yet spiritually uh, weak and spiritually wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, allowing all kinds of things to go on uh, within the church that, that I believe Jesus is just as much troubled about today as he was evidently troubled about the church of the Laodiceans in this day. And so he gives this introduction of himself and in our, in our focus upon him to begin our study of this seventh letter, notice two things about him. First of all, he is sincere in all conversation. In all of his talk, in all of his speech, in all of his conversation, he is, he is indeed sincere. These things, he said, these things said the amen the faithful and true witness. Do you know the Bible refers to God oftentimes as the God of truth. Amen. That's who He is. He is the God of truth. And in John chapter 14, verse 6, remember how Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so Jesus is the truth. And that's understandable because we know that Jesus is God according to the Bible. Amen. And so he's the God of truth. Jesus is truth. And so he introduces himself to the church of the Laodiceans as one who is absolutely sincere in all of his conversation. Uh, he is the God of truth. He is the amen. The amen. That phrase amen is, is ordinarily used at the end of a statement, at the end of a sentence, and it is used to guarantee the truth of what has been spoken. We use it today and we maybe use it when we say amen to the 
preaching and, and a, a good way to uh, define that is to say, uh, I agree or may it be so. Uh, that's what the word amen. Really, really another way of saying it and probably a more uh, proper way of saying the, uh, the interpretation or the understanding of the word is to say, that's right. <laughs> that's true. When you say amen, it's like you're saying, that's right. And uh, that is true. And so Jesus says that he is actually the amen. He is the one who guarantees the truth. When Jesus Christ says that he is the amen, then we can know that he is always reliable. Can you say amen to that? He is always reliable. There's, there, there really is not a more fitting word to describe God uh, in all the world, in all of uh, this, the God of the Bible, really not a more fitting word to describe him than to use that word, amen. <laughs> he's the truth. He is right. Uh, he's the amen. And then Jesus said he's not only the amen, but also that he is the faithful and true witness. The faithful and true witness. That is, he is absolute truth. That everything he says is absolutely true. He is as I said, sincere in all of his conversation. He is absolutely true in everything that he says. In other words, he says what he means and he means what he says. Amen. And his word is the word of truth. This Bible that we have, it is the word of God. And we have the very words of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And his words are truth. He, he never uh, spoke an untruth. He never would tell a lie. The Bible tells us that God cannot lie. The Word of God cannot lie. The Scriptures do not lie. And so He is the, he is the truth and He is the God of truth and He is the Amen, the faithful and true witness, absolutely uh, true, absolute truth in everything that He says. He says what He means and He means what He says. And so He is sincere in all of His conversation. You know, to uh, bring all that home to understand this, we can, we can with all confidence tell anyone and say to anyone that what Jesus Christ has said, dear friend, you can believe it. You can believe it and you can receive it and you can have it if you would just express your faith and confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and trust Him to be your Savior Follow Him as your Lord. You can understand He's the Amen. He's the faithful and true witness. He will never steer you the wrong way. Amen. Wherever He leads you, it will always be the right way. Wherever He takes you, it will always be the good way. It may not always be the easy way. His disciples, when He was here on the earth and they followed Him, they, they, they did not have it easy all the time. But I would submit to you this evening, dear friend, that they had it good all the time. Can you imagine what it was like to sit down at his feet and hear him express the parables to the, uh, uh, to the crowds and they would sit there and listen and, and, and on more than one occasion the disciples after the crowds would be dispersed and, and those disciples would gather around him and they would come to him and say something like, Master, Lord, uh, uh, tell us, explain to us the, the parable. Tell us a little more. And he would do that. He would take the time to explain it to them uh, more fully and more detail and help them to understand even more so than his preaching to the crowds. What an amazing thing that would be to imagine what it would have been like to have walked with him and, 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 and go to, the, to that home in Bethany of, of Lazarus and his sisters, uh, Mary and Martha, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, visit in that home and uh, have a meal together and then just sit and just listen to his conversations uh, with the people that would come to him. When, uh, when Martha uh, came to him and, and, uh, and, and, and she was all busy uh, fixing the meal, fixing the dinner, and she looked in the, I guess we would call it in the, in the living room or in the den. And she was out in the kitchen. And she looked around for her sister Mary. She needed some help and she wasn't there. And she looked in the room and found Mary sitting at the Lord's feet and just listening to him talk. 
And Martha uh, asks the Lord, Lord, and I paraphrase a little bit, but she says, Lord, uh, bid Mary, tell her to come help me in the kitchen. You remember Jesus said, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Can you imagine those disciples sitting there and hearing that and watching the reactions between Jesus and Mary and Martha and others as well? Can you imagine being there when he uh, actually uh, uh, would touch the eyes of the blind man and and, and, and give him sight. Imagine being there when they stopped that funeral procession out of the city of Nain and, and, uh, and, and Jesus tell, speaks to the young man that was dead and tells him to arise and the young man uh, uh, arises from the dead and Jesus presents him to, uh, uh, to his mother. Imagine all the times when the disciples were gathered around there and all the things that they saw everything that he did everywhere that he led them was the right way and everything that they saw him do was the good thing and the best thing he is the one who is sincere in all conversation in all of his works and all that he did you can trust what jesus christ has done and you can trust what jesus christ says amen he is sincere in all conversation. Then number two, we should think of him as the source of all creation. The source of all creation. Notice again the verse in Revelation chapter 3 to the angel of the church and Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness. He is sincere in all conversation. But then he says, The beginning of the creation of God. You see that? The beginning of the creation of God. He is the source of all creation. When it says the beginning of the creation of God, understand this, uh, it does not mean, it, you may take that phrase and try, to, and try to twist it around and some people may try to do it and they say, well that means that Jesus was created by God, the first creation. No, that's not what it means. The beginning here means source and origin. That's the definition of the word. That's what it means. Where it started. How it starts, the beginning, the source, the origin. And so he is the source of all creation. When it says the beginning of the creation of God, it doesn't mean the first thing that God created, but, but it means that Jesus Christ is in fact the source and the origin of all that God did create. Amen. He's the beginning of it. He's, he's the one that started it. Uh, he's the one that created it. He's the source and the uh, and, uh, and origin of the creation of all the creation of God. And in fact, you'll remember in John chapter 1, if you want to look there with me, I'll read a little bit of it. John's Gospel chapter 1 and the first, uh, the first few verses there. John chapter 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So everything was made by Him. Made by who? By the Word. By the one that it, it is speaking of in verse number 1 by the term Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. You notice that the Word in our Bible is capitalized. It, it begins in the, in the uppercase there. Uh, this is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and you know this because of the way John continues to write when he says in verse 4, In Him was light, and the, it was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And let me just go on and continue to read. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. That's John the Baptist. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. You'll notice the word light is capitalized, just as the word word is capitalized here. Uh, it, this is all referring to a man. It's all referring to an individual. 
an individual that was in the beginning, an individual that was with God, an individual that was God, an individual by whom that all things were made by Him. And without Him, there was nothing made that was made. He is the source of all the creation. He is the source of, of all creation. And He is the light. And John the Baptist would bear witness of the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number 9. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And then John, uh, the disciple, makes it plain here who this word is and who this light is. He says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And the very next verse, uh, John, it says that John, John the Baptist, bear witness of him. This is speaking of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says very plainly that he is the creator of all things. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He is, he is life, and he is the light of men. John the Baptist bore uh, witness to this truth. And so he is not only sincere in all his conversation that he is the amen, the faithful and true witness, but he is in fact the source of all creation, the beginning of all the creation of God. And Jesus Christ is the creator. And in John chapter number 1, uh, just review that again and you'll see and understand that Jesus Christ is the creator both of physical life and of spiritual life. Amen. Physical life and spiritual life. That's who he is. Now let's just think about him a little bit more this evening. For one thing, he is in fact the provider of of a new life provider of new life second corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 the bible says therefore if any man be in christ he is a new creature old things are passed away behold all things are become new that is jesus christ he is the source of a new life and, and the truth of the matter is dear friend you have to have a new life in order to know god uh, because you, the, the Bible tells us in John chapter 3, Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't know the kingdom of God. You can't know God. You'll never know God if you don't know Jesus Christ. He is the source of all creation and he is the provider of the new life uh, that comes when you've been born again. And it doesn't stop there. We could just make a list and, and, and probably as we would go through it and think about it, other things would come to our thoughts, to our mind. I just thought of a few things actually this, this afternoon and, uh, and jotted them down just to remind you. For one thing, when it comes to Jesus as the source of all creation, the beginning of the creation of God, He is the provider of life, but He is also the giver of abundant life. Amen. He is the giver of abundant life. John chapter 10, verse 10, he said, The thief, speaking of the devil, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. That's what Jesus said. He is the giver of abundant life. And there is no greater uh, life of abundance than the life of being a follower, a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. It starts out with that new birth, being born again by the Spirit of God, confessing Jesus Christ as your Savior, and then following Him and, and hearing Him and walking with Him and loving Him and serving Him. It, it's the greatest life that there is to live. There is no other life to compare to it. He gives abundant life. He is the giver of abundant life. He is the source of eternal life. John chapter 5, verse 24. Jesus says, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my words and believeth on him that hath sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. 
He says, if you'll just hear me, and if you'll believe me, and you trust in me, that's what Jesus says. You do that, and you can have the gift, the promise of an eternal life, of an everlasting life, and it begins the very moment that you call upon the name of the Lord by faith and believing prayer, as Romans chapter 10, verse 13 says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The very moment that you call on the name of the Lord Jesus, He gives you the promise of eternal, everlasting life. He says you, you shall not come into condemnation, but is already passed from death death into life. Amen. When does eternal life start? It starts the day you get saved. Amen. It starts the day you trust the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, it starts when you get to heaven. No, it's, it, it starts before you get to heaven. And dear friend, the truth of the matter is, it must start before you get to heaven. Because if you don't already have it, you're not going to heaven. You have to be saved. You have to be born again. He is the giver of abundant life, the provider of new life. He is the source of eternal life. And then another thought that would come to our mind is that He is the only way of salvation. John 14, 6 again, He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. But I like what it says in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, what Peter said when he said, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's no other name. There's no other way. There, there's, there's no other chance. The only way that you can be saved and the only way that you can receive eternal life is to believe upon and to receive Jesus Christ who is the source of all creation. The one who is sincere in all his conversation. He says what he means and he means what he says and he will not lie to you. He will not steer you wrong. He will not lead you wrong. He will lead you to heaven. He will lead you to the presence of God. He will lead you to eternal life because he himself is the giver and the provider and the source of that eternal life. Can I add this one thing for, for us this evening? Just a reminder for all of this and for all of your friends, for all of your neighbors, for all of your family members, for all of your co-workers, and, and for maybe someone that catches this message online, dear friend, for, for anyone within the sound of my voice at any moment, at any time that, that you uh, come across uh, this, this message, this preaching, he is the one that everyone needs to meet. Amen. He's the one you need to meet. He's the one you need to know. He is the one that everyone needs to meet. I'm talking about the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He's the one that everyone needs to meet. Look over with me to verse 20 in Revelation chapter 3 where he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. You know what that verse uh, tells us? Or I, I, I would like to apply it this way. Jesus Christ is the one that you need to meet, my friend. You need to meet Him. You need to know Him. He's the one that you need to be introduced to. And Jesus says here in this verse that He will be glad to meet with you. He will be glad to meet with you. He says, I, I'll, I'll knock on your door. I'll knock on, I'll knock on your door. And you know, in a sense, it could be that that uh, maybe someone is picking up this message online and, and it seems like there's kind of a tug at the heart. There, there's, there's something that's kind of going on. And maybe you don't really understand what this feeling is. Could be just something like this. He's just knocking at your door. And he says, if you'll just pay attention, if you'll just hear, if you'll open the door, 
He said he'll come in. He'll sup with you and you with him. That is, he'll come in and he'll relate with you. In other words, he wants to meet you. Amen. Everyone. Your brother, your sister, your uh, aunt, your uncle, your mom, your dad, your, your, your husband, your wife, your son, your daughter, your cousin, whoever. Everyone. Your co-worker. Everyone needs to meet him. And he so graciously just says, look, if you just open the door, just open the door and let me in. He, said, I'll, he, he says, I'll be so glad to meet you. And my friend, if you really meet the Lord Jesus Christ, it'll be the greatest moment, the greatest day in all of your life. Amen. Some people think well, it'd be a great, great moment to meet the President of the United States and to shake his hand. It'd be a great moment to meet some you know, world-renowned uh, uh, athlete or wealthy person or businessman and, and shake their hand. What, what a marvelous thing that would be. It don't even compare. It pales in comparison with meeting Jesus because when you meet Jesus, you meet God. When you meet God, you meet the one that you need to meet more than anybody else. The one you need to know, the one you need to believe upon, the one you need to receive, that you might be saved and have the promise of everlasting life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad? Are you glad, church, for the day when you met him, <laughs> when you met Jesus? Don't ever forget that day. Hang on to it. Know that you've met uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and that you know him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand together, their heads bowed and our eyes closed for prayer. Lord, we do thank you so much for the word of God, and we thank you for this marvelous book of the Revelation. We thank you, Lord, for the introduction of yourself that you gave in your letter to the church of the Laodiceans. Lord, how that you are the amen, faithful and true witness. You're the beginning of the creation of God. Lord, you are everything, and you're the one that everyone needs to meet. So, Lord, we pray that that there'll be souls still today, people still today that will meet you. We know we're in these last days. We know there's not much time left. But Lord, we pray for people to meet you and to know you and to be saved. And Lord, we know that you're, that you're glad to meet them and you're glad to save them and change their lives and give them abundant life. We know that because you, you did it for us. And Lord, we thank you for it. Help us, Lord, to bear witness of you and we'll thank you for what you do in Jesus name we pray amen amen we'll sing the song together church as brother Tim comes and leads us page 284 mm -hmm. 